Good morning. morning. How are you? Everyone's good today? Fantastic. It is good to be here with all of you this morning. Who's uh, just waking up a little bit? Just me? Okay. (laughs) Uh, How's everyone going with their prayer and fasting? Who is enjoying the 21 days of prayer and fasting? Show of hands. Oh, look. Some of you are so hungry that you don't have the energy to lift your hand up this morning, and that's okay. We're going to keep praying with you and and for you, and uh, I've been uh, really enjoying this series called Seeds, um, and I love that we're looking at 21 days of prayer and fasting through this metaphor of seeds. I love a good metaphor. I love it. Like any, any, I'm just like, oh, symbolism in there. Um, English was my favorite subject at school, and so, you know, metaphors are great, and uh, the Bible is scattered with references. Did you get that? Scattered with references about planting. (laughs) Thank you. I wrote it myself. Uh, (laughs) uh, References about planting and harvesting seeds. And Jesus himself, you know, he uses this concept of seeds so often when he teaches. Um, And these are agricultural terms when he uh, speaks to us in parables and and the journey from seed to plant is just full of these incredible rich metaphors that we can draw upon ourselves as believers and as people who are studying the word. And it really connects with our Christian faith. This idea of uh, the phase that uh, the plant life would go through from seed to growing into something else. Um, I often, uh, we often plant thoughts and ideas and pleas to God and you know, all sorts of things in our 21 days of prayer and fasting. And, and just like a seed goes into the ground, we don't always see what it is that God is doing, but he works in the unseen. He works in the unseen to build something remarkable. Now, uh, I'm not a gardener at all, okay, so I'm not a gardener. Uh, I had a garden back in Perth, where I'm from, my hometown, and I was really excited about this garden, okay, so I had really high hopes. I had just sold my apartment, and it was this tiny little apartment, didn't even have a balcony, and uh, I I bought this townhouse unit type thing, and uh, and the reason why I bought it is because it had a backyard, and it wasn't a big backyard, but it was a backyard nonetheless, so I was like, this is going to be great, and I was so excited about this garden. I thought about all the things that I was going to plant in the garden. So, you know, things like vegetables and herbs. Uh, I like cooking. I don't like paying $3.50 for herbs that I, you know, only use half the packet. Anyone else have that? That really annoys me. Uh, So I was like, I'm going to plant my own herb garden. It's going to be fantastic. I'll get some lush green lawn out there. And I went down to Bunnings before I moved in and I bought the whole kit for gardening, okay? Like I got the Bunnings hat. I got like an apron. I got like gardening clogs, like actual gardening clogs. Um, I got Got like a little belt, and I put all my te- like tools in there. Like I don't really know what they like, but the snip snip ones and the dig dig ones. Um, so I was like, I was ready to garden. I was ready to go, and I was like, oh, I was so excited. And I moved in, and then about three weeks into moving in, I was like, it's time. Like the time has arrived to get out into my garden and you know give this a go. So I went out there, and I didn't know what I was doing, but I was like pulling things up. I was like digging things, and I was like pouring stuff on stuff. And, uh, you know, it was all seemed to be going really well. And about half an hour in, I noticed that I, I started to feel really tingly. Like, I, like my skin was feeling tingly. And I was like, oh, this is kind of weird. Um, but, uh, you know, I don't know. And then uh, my gloves, like they were just getting tighter and tighter as I went on. And I was like, I'm not really like a big manual labor person. I don't know if you know that about me. So I was like, maybe I'm just like hot because I'm just not used to like working. Uh, So I was like, okay, maybe I just need to go inside and have a drink of water. And I walked inside and as I walked past the mirror in my my hallway, I looked at myself and uh, honestly, I was so blotchy. I was just exploding out. I was like, if you've seen the Incredible Hulk, you know, when he starts like morphing, that was me. Like, but instead of like going green, I was like red, like red welts everywhere. I ripped off the um, gloves of my hands and uh, they were, my hands were like fat burger patties. They were just like red and swollen. And um, I don't, till this day, like I don't know um, what it was that um, I reacted to. I think that I'm just allergic to gardening personally. I think that's what it is. Um, And uh, so since then, I have uh, developed quite a dislike for gardening, and I've never done it since. I literally have never done it since. Um, So we're in this series called Seeds. (laughs) And, uh, you know, I actually do love this series, because I do believe that the Bible has so much to say to us about, uh, they use agriculture so much in the Bible. And so much of that stuff gets lost on us, you know, in our day and age, where we go and buy our fruits and vegetables from coals, and we don't have to garden, and we we don't have to, you know, um, like grow our own food and, and look after our own livestock. So um, it's really great to look at this and 
I, even though I do have this disdain for gardening, I do love David Attenborough, so I've watched a lot of videos recently about seeds uh, because we're getting ready for this series. And what I do know about a seed is that it goes into um, the ground, and I think, Jan Janelle, did you put this together? Yeah, so she's our resident gardener, well done. Look at, look at the life, she's grown, amazing. But I do know with a seed, you put it into, a, um, into the dirt, okay? So a seed goes into the dirt, and then it goes into this, this dirty, quiet place where we cover it up with soil, with dirt, and then we drown it with water. And then we pour manure over the top, you know? And then I know that the seed then like has to, it has like a shell around it. And what happens is, is that that shell needs to crack. The shell needs to crack. It needs to break open. And when it does, the roots of that seed go deep into the ground. And they go deep, deep into the ground. And those roots are what nourishes and feeds that seed. And then from there, once that seed is nourished, a shoot will push up through all that dirt, through all that manure, and come out into the light and grow into what God intended it to be. And I look at that and I think, wow, how much is that like us and our journey in faith so often? <laughs> you know, we like plant these seeds and, you know, and we go deeper in our faith with God. And as we do, God builds something and grows something remarkable in us as we become more of what he created us to be. I love this idea of seeds, you know, and I, like, I think it's of this uh, process of like things needing to break off, you know? Before anything grows, stuff needs to break off. And I think that's so true for us, and that's what we're really gonna be looking at today. In John 12, 24 to 25, it says, very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Now, Jesus isn't saying here, like, you've got to despise your life, like, oh, I hate it, you know, and just complain about it. That's not what he's saying, okay? Um, what he means here is that we have to die to ourselves. We have to die to ourselves and our own selfish desires and our own selfish wants and actually pick up what it is that he calls us for, what he is that he, like, presses into us and step into that new that he has for us. He's saying that the best development that we can have for our lives come from when we let go of what we think it should look like and grasp onto what he calls us for it to look like. I love how the message paraphrase puts it. It says, listen carefully. Unless a grain of wheat is buried in the ground, dead to the world, it is never more than a grain of wheat. But if it is buried, it sprouts and reproduces itself many times over. In the same way, anyone who holds on to life just as it is, destroys that life. But if you let it go, reckless in your love, you'll have it forever, real and eternal. I love that. If we hold on to it just as it is, it destroys us. But if we let it go and grasp onto the things of God, there's something eternal in that. There's something eternal in that. And church, I wonder today in this season of prayer and fasting, what is it that needs to be broken off in your life? What is it that needs to be broken off in your life, in your heart, from your soul, for God to spring the new forth? for God to bring the new in your life? What are you holding on to just as it is? And what do you need to let go of? What needs to crack? What needs to crack today? Uh, for the last uh, 10 years, actually, I've kept this journal. And it's this one right here. Um, I brought it in. If you find it, please don't read it. Um, it's, my, it's got my secrets in it. <laughs> But I brought it in today to show you. This is my uh, journal. I've had it for 10 years, and it's the same journal that I use every New Year's Day. So I only use it on New Year's Day, and I've used it for the last 10 years, and I go down to the beach on New Year's Day, and I just sit on the beach, and I pray to God about the year ahead. And I just say, God, like, talk to me about what the year ahead is. You know, what is it that you want me to, like, be thinking about? What is it that you want me to be focusing on? Like, where is it that, you know, you want me to go this year? And uh, I, I went down, you know, the start of this year like I do every other year, and the word that God gave me for this year was grow, the word grow. And uh, I thought that's pretty funny because I'm really short, um, but I was like, I appreciate it, Lord. <laughs> you know, and I was really excited about this word grow, um, not just because I want to be taller, but I actually do enjoy uh, learning and I, I love it when God like stretches me and develops me, at least I think I do. And I, I was like super excited. I was like, yes, Lord, grow me. You know, and he gave me this uh, passage out of Isaiah and I was like, yes, God, you know, stretch the place of my tent. You know, like, come on, you know, like, let's do new things. And, and I was so pumped. And then, you know, a week into January, like these, these challenges started coming up and it was like challenge after challenge after challenge 
challenge and, you know, um, things that I had to, like, just gl- I had to grow through. And uh, I got to, you know, I'm in March now, and, and I'm like, can we not grow? Like, can my word for the year be nap? Like, is that, I'd love it if God gave me that word for the year. He never has. And I was like, can we just stop? Like, Lord, Lord, are you sure it was grow? You know? And I mean, it's March, church. You know, we've had January, and then we've had February. That's not even a real month, you know? It's like a short change you in February. It's like a short month. And we're not even, like, we're halfway through March, and I'm already like, Lord, please don't grow me anymore. <laughs> like, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. You know, and sometimes I want to be growing, and we want to stretch, and we want to experience all these things that God has for us. But with that comes... Uh, uh, you know, the, the difficulty of that, the difficulty of having to look within ourselves and actually explore what it is that we actually need to grow into. You know, I pray for growth, but I, pr- I, I receive growing pains. You know, I pray for patience. And suddenly there's all these situations where I have to experience and practice my patience. <laughs> I pray for love of people, and then people come across my path that are not so easy to love. <laughs> We do this as a church sometimes, don't we? You know, we pray for revival. But revival requires us to go deeper in our faith. You know, we pray for development opportunities, but it requires more of our time and time investing into other people. We pray for growth, yet it means that we need more people to volunteer and serve to meet the need of that growth. You know, we pray for these things to grow us and stretch us, but often it requires something of us. Um, I love, you know, we love passages like Psalm 23 where it says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, he makes me lie down. And so many of us would love it if the psalm just stopped there, you know, just like, <laughs> the Lord's right, he makes me lie down, full stop, the end, okay, thank you, you know? I'm like, that would be amazing, that would be awesome. Um, but, you know, the psalm goes on to say, as I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, his rod and his staff will come at me, you know, and, and, and we don't want to go, I, I read things like that, I'm like, Lord, do not send me through the valley of the shadow of what now? Like, <laughs> please no. But he's always with us in those places and he causes us, he, he goes through seasons in our life where he grows us and he stretches us and he wants to bring something new inside of us. God is not in the business of leaving us where we are. He's not in the business of leaving us where we are. In Ephesians 4, 22, it says, You were taught with regard to your former ways of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. It says to put off your old self and put on your new self, to create created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. You know, church, prayer and fasting. Prayer and fasting, it is about seeking God to bring out the new. The new ideas, the refreshed marriage, the restored relationships, the novel possibilities at work. It's about planting seeds of faith that that God will hear our prayers and like a seed goes into the ground. We don't know when or how it will grow, but we trust that God is doing his work in that unseen place. But in order for the new to come about, it requires something of us to shake off the old, to break off the old and step into the new. And I know so often my response to that is covered with like, well, God, I really like my comfort. <laughs> like, I want to stay in my shell, you know? Last night, we were out at dinner with some of the young adults, and they were asking me uh, some questions that were quite vulnerable questions, and I was like, I just want to stay in my shell. Don't ask me that, you know? <laughs> there are moments where, you know, God shows me things inside my heart, in my life that I do that don't please him, that don't honor the people that he's put around me, and I want to grow. I want to grow. I so want to go there, but I, I don't like looking at my ugly you know, I don't like looking at my mess sometimes because it's like uncomfortable and it requires me to accept that there's something about me that actually needs to change. There's something about me that I actually have to humble myself to and actually believe that I can actually push through and I have to work through that. You know, and I have to crack. And so sometimes for us, you know, those 21 days of prayer and fasting, they come around in our church and, you know, we don't want to go to those places. So 21 days of prayer and fasting becomes something cute that our church do. It's like, that's nice that our church does that, you know, but we don't necessarily want to fully engage in it because we don't want to embrace and go to that place where God actually starts to break things open inside of us. But, you know, if we want to grow, if we really want to grow into the true image of what God created us to be, we need to be willing to crack. Turn to the person sitting next to you and say, I need to crack. (laughs) I need to crack. (laughs) 
Okay, now some of you are looking at me this morning and you're thinking, Brasita, I have been walking with the Lord for hundreds of years. And, uh, you know, when God points things out to me, I'm like, yes, Lord, take it. And I'm like, well, great, I need to get around you. I need to get around you. And that's great. But I want us to look at this passage from Luke 8, and it's the parable of the sower. And Andrew Chisholm did share it in our first week, and we're going to hone in on a particular part of it. Jesus tells a story one day, and he says, a farmer went out to sow his seed. And as he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. It was trans- put on and the birds ate it up. Some fell on rocky ground and when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seed fell among thorns which grew up with it and choked the plant. Still, other seed fell on good soil. It came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than was sown. And see, a lot of us, like we read a passage like this and we think like, oh, Lord, thank you so much that, you know, when there's seed out there, like birds don't come in my life, they don't gobble it up. And I look after my seed because I pour water on it. And like, thank you, Lord Jesus, looking forward to your 100 fold harvest here. You know, we get excited about words like this. But if we're not careful, a lot of us can fall into the third descriptor here. And I want us to look at it a little bit more closely in Luke 8, 7. It says, other seed fell among thorns which grew up with it, everyone say with it, with it, and choked the plants. Now you see, we can let the things of God grow inside us and through us and in our church and in our hearts, but if we're not careful, other things can grow up with it. It says here the thorns grew up with it and choked the plants. The problem isn't that good things are growing. The problem isn't that good things are happening. The problem is what else is growing with it. What else is growing with it? You know how I told you my story about my crazy, crazy garden experience that made me allergic to gardening? Well, I, uh, you know, after that I was done with gardening, so I just left it. I left my garden and I just, and the garden did what gardens do. You know, it just like grew and it spread and it, you know, just things, and flowers flowered and, and whatever gardens do, it just kept going. And then one day I walked past the window in my laundry and I literally, this is how like neglected it was. I looked outside and the weeds, I kid you not, I know I have a flair for the dramatic, but this is a true, true story. Like the weeds were like up here. They were up here. And now I'm a short person, but I know weeds are not meant to grow up here, okay? Like, they're just not. And it was all really dry, so it looked like I was harvesting hay. Like, it was ridiculous. Like, you could do crop circles out there. It was crazy. Um, So I was like, oh, my goodness, what has happened? And because I had let it just do its thing, I hadn't paid attention to it, everything just went crazy out there. Like, it was all this sorts of stuff was growing. It was growing out of control. It was growing out of control. You know, if we're not careful about what's going on inside of our hearts, if we're not paying attention to that, anything can grow with it. Anything can grow with it. In Proverbs 4.23, then grow wild, that's what I meant. In Proverbs 4.23, it says, above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Everything you do flows from it. You know, guarding means to be actively aware of it, to take care of it, to look into it, to, you know, check up on its progress, see how it's going, you know, and that's what we need to do with our hearts. We need to make sure that other things aren't growing with it. I'm going to give you some examples this morning so this lands at home, and this is the part where people start to look down in this message. Okay, you pray for new things to be birthed in your church, but you don't like it that things aren't the way they were before, so bitterness begins to grow. You pray and you fast for breakthrough, but you worry about whether or not it will really happen and anxiety begins to grow. You pray and you fast for healing, and you've been praying and fasting for a long time, and that healing hasn't come. So doubt begins to grow. You start noticing, why do they get healed? Why do they get answered prayers? What about me? Comparison begins to grow. You pray and you fast for opportunities, leadership roles, you know, promotions at work, and pride begins to grow. I deserve that. I have a right to that. I have a right to say that. You pray and you fast for opportunities. You pray for your life group to grow, that you would meet people, opportunities to meet people, to grow your life group, and you get really excited about it. But then all these new people start coming along, and you run out of room, and then you have to multiply. And you start to resent the fact that you have to multiply, and resentment begins to grow. Is this hitting home for somebody? (laughs) Resentment begins to grow. You know, if we're not careful... If we're not careful, things like pride, things like resentment, things like anxiety, things like doubt, things like bitterness, they can grow up just as easily 
with the things that we're praying for and they come along and they choke the life out of this thing that God is growing inside of us. If we're not careful, that's what happens. You know, some of us, we need to actually be looking at the good things that are happening in our lives, but we also need to be looking at what thorns might be growing in our hearts today, what thorns might be growing in our hearts. All right, now, I'm going to be honest with you. Like I said, this is really labor-intensive stuff, um, so it requires a lot of us. It requires so much of us. And some of us, you know, maybe you're a bit like me, you don't really want to go there all the time. You don't really want to go there all the time. So what some of us tend to do is we put out fake grass. We put out fake grass in our gardens, okay? Now, you know, my crazy garden was out of control. So what I did is I had to hire a gardener to come in and take care of it for me. And it cost me a small fortune, let me tell you. Like, it was so expensive, but it was like the jungles of Malaysia out there. So I was happy to pay and give him my firstborn child uh, to take care of that. You know, and at the end, I asked him, like, what can I do to uh, make this whole gardening thing just not a thing? And uh, he said to me, why don't you put in fake lawn? And he gave me this brochure for fake lawn. You know, for some of us, you know, we, we don't want to deal with the pain, with the, the struggle of having to look within ourselves and having to question within ourselves the energy it takes to actually grow and develop and to actually go to those places and accept that it's something that we need to do. So we just fake lawn our lives. We just fake lawn our lives. Fake grass, fake flowers, fake plants, fake fruit, fake everything. Fake, just fake it. You know, we're like, I don't want to crack. I don't want to go there. I don't have things to be broken off me. I don't want to go there. You know, I get in moods like this where, like, I, I have this thing where I'm just, like, really working on uh, just having good peace with people. And I'm like, but when I'm tired, like, I get really snippy, I get sarcastic, I get, like, really grumpy. And so I had this, like, we were doing camp recently for young adults, and I had, like, a list of people I had to apologise to. It was actually on my to-do list, <laughs> write apology letters to people. I kid you not, it's actually still on my whiteboard if you want to go have a look. <laughs> and uh, I was like, all these people I have to apologise to, and I was like, I don't want to do it. Like, I do not want to go and, like, admit these things that I'm working through with people, um, but I know that I have to. I know that I have to, you know? And so, but I would rather, sometimes I'm just, I'd rather just fake my way through it, you know? I'd rather just pretend, like, pretend we never had that conflict. Let's just pretend nothing happened, you know? I just smile my way through it. I just see them at home in the chair. I'm like, hi, you know, just, like, avoid them because I don't want to deal with it. I want to fake lawn it, you know? But God is like, grow, Let's grow through this. Let's grow better together. It's just easier sometimes to fake it, though. And we do this, you know. We come to church and we're like, yes, Lord, make me a vessel. Make me whatever you want me to be. But in our hearts, we're like, but please don't send me on some crazy mission field trip. Like, I don't want to be living out in some, like, place like that it doesn't have running water, Lord, you know. Like, we're just like, send, like, send me to places that are easy, God, you know. And we're fake. We fake it. You know, we, we, uh, people ask us, how are we going? How are you going? And we're like, yes, I'm going great. Things are amazing. You know, but like really at home, you know, our marriage is suffering. Our, our, you know, our kids are struggling. You know, maybe we're struggling with loneliness, you know, and we fake, we fake it, fake it, fake it. You know, there's opportunities in our services where you can come down the front to receive prayer for the things that you're struggling with. But so many of us, we just stay in our seats and we're like, everything's good everything's fine. You know, if I go down there, maybe they'll think that I've got some big sin in my life. You know, they'll think that I'm like really struggling with something. So we just fake it. We're just like, I'm good. I'm good. I'm fine. I've got nothing. Like me, you mean Jesus, we're tight. We're fine. You know, we don't want to go there. We don't want to go there. We don't have to deal with our mess. We don't want to grow. You know, church, I started looking into that whole fake grass thing for my garden at home. And here's what I learned about fake grass. It's expensive and it doesn't last. It's expensive and it doesn't last. It costs you a small fortune to put in. And once it's in, it doesn't last forever. The sun fades it, it can get damaged, it needs to be replaced after time. It might make life easier for a while. You might even be able to pull it off for years at a time. But there comes a point where it breaks down and friends, that's going to cost you. That's going to cost you. In Proverbs 11, 13, it says, the integrity of the upright guides them, but the unfaithful are destroyed by their duplicity. They're destroyed. I mean, that's such a strong word. It's destroyed by their fakeness. It, it eats us up. You know, eventually fate becomes exhausting. It fades and it can't be held up forever. So don't replace the things that God wants to grow in your life with fake. Don't replace it with fake. 
Okay, and finally, some of us, you know, we get so fed up with this idea of growing and having to go there to those places of what God wants to break off us that we end up just paving the whole thing over with cement. (laughs) And that's exactly what I did with my garden back in Perth. (laughs) Went all Italian on it, just cement the whole thing. (laughs) I was like, I was like, I'm done. You know, sometimes, church, we go through these really harrowing experiences, and I mean, we don't want to allow anything to get close to our heart again. We don't want anything to go there again. We don't want to let anyone in. We don't even sometimes want to let God in. We don't want to let us grow in that capacity because we're like, I put myself out there. I gave it a go. I trusted that person. I tried that once, and I got so hurt in the process that I don't want to go there. I can't bear the thought of going there again. It may have been someone that hurt you, someone that betrayed you. It could even be a prayer that you've been praying for years upon years that hasn't been answered, and you get to a point where you're like, I am done. The hurt is too much. We think things like, what good is prayer if the prayer goes unanswered? What good is fasting if things don't change? Or they hurt me. They hurt me so much that I'm not, they're not worthy of my prayers. They don't deserve my kindness. So we don't let anyone in. We shut everything off. We're so sick of the pain. And instead of guarding our hearts, like the word says, we end up paving our hearts. We pave our hearts. And we end up with this hard heart towards the things of what God actually wants for our lives. The restoration, the good relationships, the joy, the peace, the freedom that he offers us. I, uh, some of you know a bit about my story and a bit about my background. Um, I've shared a bit of it in the past. But I actually grew up in a household that was incredibly violent. So uh, my dad was, um, a, he was a wonderful man in so many ways. Um, but he was also incredibly violent. And uh, I remember my childhood was one that was, was incredibly marked by fear. And it was just a, a very uh, horrible place to grow up. And my earliest memories are of my dad beating up my mum and then coming after us kids. And I was uh, terrified of him. I was terrified of my dad when he got into those places. And uh, he was in my life as my, in my childhood and then my teenage years. My mum remarried, um, and, uh, but my dad was still around for quite a while. And then one day, um, just it was quite out of the blue, he uh, just decided to cut me off from his life. So he sent me an email, and he was just like, we're done. And he, like, you know, the whole works, so deleted me off Facebook, everything, like blocked my number, just completely cut me out of his life. And uh, I was so angry at him. Like, I was like, you just, like, ruined my childhood and I'm, I'm mad at you. Like, I was so mad at him. And I would get updates every now and then about what he was doing through my older brother, who he was still in touch with. Um, but I didn't really, like, know much about what he was doing. One day I was going for a jog um, on the foreshore in Perth and I got back to my car and I had like 10 missed phone calls on my phone. And um, I called back and it was the local hospital and they said, "Uh, your father has had a massive stroke. Um, He's living in Perth. I didn't even know he was living in Perth. Um, He's had a massive stroke and you need to come into the hospital right now. You're the only relative in the same country as him. And uh, I was, I'm ashamed to admit it now, but at the time I was so angry at him that I was like, I'm not coming in. Like, that's very nice, nurse man, but I'm not coming in. Like, it's just like, I'm not going to do it. I'm just not going to do it. And uh, he was like, I I find at times like this, it's best to put those things aside and come anyway. And I was like, that's great. Thank you. Bye. I was like, no, I'm not doing it. I was I'm so, so mad at him. And uh, I went down, I just went and sat by the river and I had my, I took my Bible out and I was like, God, like, you have to help me, like, figure out what I'm going to do in this situation. Like, Lord, you have to help me. And I was praying about it, and I was like reading over my Psalms, and uh, I felt God say, and I've got it written down in my Bible at home, these words. I said, he said to me, don't let the anger of today steal from the joy of your tomorrow. Don't let the anger of today steal from your joy, the joy of your tomorrow. So I was like, all right, God, okay. I got up, and I went to the hospital, and I didn't know how he was going to react to seeing me because, um, we, like I said, we had a strain, very strained relationship. Uh, and I walked in, and he couldn't speak, but when he saw me, his whole face lit up, and he put out his arms, and I just hugged him. But I was still so mad, you know? I was still so mad. Uh, and I just was like, I just got to sit through this. And I just kept thinking about those words that God said to me, you know, don't let your anger of today, don't let the anger of today steal from your tomorrow, you know. And uh, so I stayed with him over those days and I was just praying and praying. And over that time, God just began to crack those things off my heart, you know, break off that hardness, break off those things that I had been uh, holding against my dad. 
you know? And I went from this place of just being so mad and so angry to this place of just forgiveness, this place of peace, and this place of freedom, this place of freedom to be able to reconcile with him. He passed away four days later, but in that time, you know, it went from me being so angry at the thought of even seeing him to me just curling up in that bed with him as he passed away and just telling him that I loved him. And even today, you know, I get like emotional just thinking about because I miss him, you know? I'm not angry anymore. I, I genuinely love him and I miss him. But I was free. I got free of that anger. I got free of that hardness of my heart. I got free of that place. Now, hear me when I say this, you know, it's not that we shouldn't address hard issues and these things that come up in our families. And City Life Church, we have a zero tolerance, you know, policy towards family violence or abuse of any form. And we need to address these matters in our community, in our society. I 100% believe that. But there came a point for me personally, and I'm talking about me personally here, where I had to choose where I could stay a victim of what happened to me or I could be the victor. I had to choose. I could choose whether I could live my life and my future with fear and doubt and forever not trusting people, forever not trusting men, you know, or I could allow God to do his deep work inside of my heart and create a new life in me, to break things off me and create a new life in me. I didn't want my life to be defined by the things that had happened to me and I didn't want my future to be robbed by the mistakes of other people. I had to deal with the hardness of my heart. I had to allow God to go to those places, to deal with the bitterness and to deal with the cement that I had poured all over it, poured just all over it. For the sake of my future, for the sake of my future relationships, for the sake of my freedom, I had to surrender my anger. I had to surrender it because God intends to make something beautiful within us. You know, he intends for us to have restoration and peace. And you know, church, that person that hurt you once, and I'm, I'm genuinely sorry that they hurt you, but that unforgiveness that you carry in your heart towards them, it's going to destroy your capacity to understand grace. That lack of trust that you carry because someone betrayed you will rob you of the joy that you could have in future relationships. That church member that made a decision that you didn't agree with, that caused resentment to build inside of you, that cynical view you now have of church leadership, that can steal the love, joy, and peace that you can find in the family of God. You might think that you're protecting your heart. You might think that you're guarding it well. You might even think that you're protecting other people. But really, you're pouring cement over something that God intended to be beautiful. You're pouring cement over it. God wants to deal with our messy church. He wants to deal with our messy. He wants to deal with those messy places in our heart. He wants us to grow roots that go so deep down inside his word, the understanding of who he is, so that he can shoot us up through all that mess and create a beautiful new life in us. You know, but in order to do that, in order to do that, church, we need to be willing to crack. We need to be willing to pull the thorns out of our hearts. We need to be willing to put away the fake grass and we need to be willing to smash through that cement. We need to be willing to go there. I'm often uh, reminded of the story of the woman caught in adultery when I think about these things. And I love how kind Jesus is that he will always go to those messy places with us. He always goes to those messy places with us. And in the story of this woman caught in adultery, you know, she's taken out and she's thrown in front of this crowd, this angry mob of people who just want to stone her to death. You know, the word tells us that she was caught in the act so a lot of commentators and scholars believe that she was actually completely naked when she was thrown in front of that angry crowd. And she's, you know, people are calling for her to die for her sin. And what does Jesus do in this situation? He gets down into the dirt with her. He bends right down into the dirt. And he begins riding in the dirt. And I think about that position of vulnerability that he's in, this angry crowd all around and he's gone into this place of humility, this place of vulnerability, this place of fear, and he sits in the dirt with her. He sits in the dirt with her. And that's exactly what he does for us, church. It's exactly what he does for us. He comes and he sits in our dirty, messy, ugly places, and he meets us there. And church, I'm gonna invite you now to stand. And this is not the end of our service. This is just the, the middle end. And we're going to sing this song, New Wine, together as a church. And during this moment of us singing this song together, 
I want us to reflect on the words that we're singing this morning. Because this isn't just lip service that we pay to God. These are words, the declarations over our lives, over our families, over our workplaces, our neighbourhood, our church. And as we sing, my prayer is that we would start to just go to those places that need to be broken off. Ask God, what is it, Lord, that needs to be taken off, that doesn't please you from my heart? What thorn needs to be taken out this morning? What fake needs to be put away? What cement needs to be broken through, God? What thorns need to be taken out? As we sing, let's allow God to do as the psalmist says. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting.